Welcome to the Culture of Healthcare, Evidence-Based Practice. This is Lecture G. The component, The Culture of Healthcare, addresses job expectations in healthcare settings. It discusses how care is organized within a practice setting, privacy laws, and professional and ethical issues encountered in the workplace. By the end of this unit, Evidence-Based Practice, students will be able to define the key tenets of evidence-based medicine, or EBM, and its role in the culture of healthcare construct answerable clinical questions, and critically appraise evidence answering them. Explain how EBM can be applied to intervention studies, including the phrasing of answerable questions, finding evidence to answer them, and applying them to given clinical situations. Describe how EBM can be applied to key clinical questions of diagnosis, harm, and prognosis. Discuss the benefits and limitations to summarizing evidence. Describe how EBM is used in clinical settings through clinical practice guidelines and decision analysis. In this lecture, we discuss in detail practice guidelines and decision analysis. What is a clinical practice guideline? It's basically a series of steps, sometimes called an algorithm, that walks us through the provision of clinical care, either the workup to reach a diagnosis or the steps of the treatment. Clinical practice guidelines can be provided in a number of ways. Sometimes they're presented in a textual format or in tables that list steps to be taken in certain conditions. Often they're presented as an algorithm. Algorithms have different types of steps. Action steps describe specific actions for us to perform. Conditional steps describe an action based on some criterion. In branch steps, the flow may be directed to one or more other steps. Finally, in synchronization steps, we come back from the branch steps to a single point. This slide shows a very simple practice guideline that might be used, for example, to decide whether someone should get a flu shot. The recommendations on who should get a flu shot vary, but in this guideline, we see who they're recommended for. Our first action step in the guideline is to collect some data. We branch because we need to get two pieces of data the occupation of the individual, and his or her age. We wait until we get both pieces of data, which is synchronization step one. We then reach conditional step one, where we ask if the age is less than 12. According to this guideline, we should immunize everyone who is under the age of 12, and we should use the pediatric dosage that is modified for their weight and size. If they are older than 12, we then ask if they are a health care worker or are older than age 65. If either is true, we give the adult dosage. We go to that action step. Otherwise, which probably doesn't reflect current practice, we don't. This is a sample algorithm to show you the different kinds of steps that you might see in a clinical practice guideline. How do we appraise a clinical practice guideline? In some ways, it's easier than appraising, say, a randomized control trial, because we have fewer questions to ask. But a clinical practice guideline has many more steps that need to be appraised as opposed to just the major question that you look at in a randomized control trial. If we retrieve a clinical practice guideline and we're thinking about putting it into practice, what questions do we ask? Essentially, there are three. The first question is, did the developers carry out a comprehensive, reproducible literature search within the last 12 months? In other words, are they up to date on their topic? If they are looking at diagnosis of a certain type of cancer, for example, or at treatment of diabetes, are they current on the latest evidence? Have they reviewed the literature comprehensively? The second question is whether each of the recommendations is tagged by the level of evidence upon which it's based and linked to a specific citation. If the practice guideline makes a recommendation for a test or treatment, what is the level of evidence to support that recommendation? Where can we find the published research? The third question pertains to applicability. Is the guideline applicable in a particular clinical setting? Applicability raises some practical questions. For example, is there a high enough burden of illness to warrant use of the guideline in this particular setting? If the disease occurs rarely, then we probably don't want to go to the trouble of changing workflow and other kinds of actions to implement the guideline. Is there adequate belief among the users of the guideline concerning the value of the interventions and their consequences? Have we convinced those who are going to implement the guideline that it's worth doing so?
and might the cost and barriers be too high for the community? If a certain type of diagnostic test or treatment is not readily available, might the barriers be too high for implementation, making the use of the guideline somewhat moot? One of the big questions with practice guidelines is whether it's more effective to use them in paper or electronic form. The problem with paper guidelines is illustrated in this slide, showing the number of guidelines these particular practitioners had received. Hibble and his co-authors collected copies of all the guidelines that had been mailed over a one-year period to a sample of 22 practices in the Cambridge and Huntington Health Authority region of England. They found that each practice received 855 guidelines, some a page or two long, some bound in booklet form, some in folders. When the guidelines were stacked, the pile was 68 centimeters high and weighed 28 kilograms, or 27 inches high and weighing 62 pounds. Clearly, it's a challenge to use any particular guideline when it's one among hundreds in a two-foot stack and you aren't sure whether it's just a sheet of paper or a spiral-bound booklet. It may be better to electronically disseminate guidelines, especially if you can codify the recommendations in the electronic health record, so that the recommendations come up automatically. Electronic health records, other clinical systems, and decision support systems can provide access to practice guidelines while the clinician is at the point of making clinical decisions. Some systems provide the capability for clinicians to import the guideline into the electronic health record so that it can be tailored to the specific patient. Research has shown that physicians often don't adhere to guidelines. Cabana and his co-authors found that guidelines weren't used by physicians for a variety of reasons. They were either unaware of them, they disagreed with them, or they didn't want to change their existing practice. In some highly regarded practices in the United Kingdom, Gabay and LeMay found that physicians and nurses rarely accessed or used research evidence. Instead, they used what the authors described as mind lines that basically represented their rationale, which at times was at odds with research evidence. In other research, Lynn found that there was a substantial lack of adherence to a guideline recommendation on the use of stress testing before percutaneous coronary intervention. That is, according to the best evidence and the guidelines that incorporate this evidence, patients should not have percutaneous coronary interventions, such as coronary angioplasty or stent placement, unless they have symptoms documented by stress testing. Yet, many cardiologists skip the step of stress testing and move straight to the percutaneous coronary intervention. In an editorial, Diamond was concerned about this finding, and he attributes the situation to financial incentives for such intervention and advocates what he calls evidence-based reimbursement. Practice guidelines certainly have limitations. One challenge for guidelines is that they are difficult to apply in complex patients. For example, a study by Boyd and colleagues looked at 15 common diseases. They took the best-known guidelines for those diseases and assessed them for use in elderly patients who had many comorbid or coexisting conditions. They reached the conclusion that following the guidelines to the letter would have undesirable effects because of the presence of these other conditions. In fact, if these guidelines were tied into pay-for-performance schemes, there may be some negative implications in that physicians who adhere to the letter of the guidelines may actually not be providing the highest quality of care. Guidelines can be difficult to implement in electronic health records. In particular, it's challenging to take the logic that is in guidelines and integrate it into the workflow. Some of the logic in guidelines is somewhat vague and may not fit into easy rules that can be implemented in a decision support system. A paper by Mavilia and co-authors gives a number of examples of that challenge. Another problem with guidelines is the influence of the pharmaceutical industry. Many individuals who work on developing clinical guidelines are also funded in part by the pharmaceutical industry. About 87% of authors, at least in the survey that was done for this paper, have ties to the industry. About 58% of them received financial support for their research, and some of those individuals also serve as employees or consultants to pharmaceutical companies, raising questions of objectivity. Also, some services and care activities recommended in a guideline may not be covered by insurance companies or may not be approved by the insurance company for payment. 
What is the future of guidelines? Many healthcare systems are convinced of their value. They are convinced that clinical practice guidelines standardize and improve care and perhaps lower costs. The use of guidelines will likely increase with both the proliferation of electronic health records and the implementation of quality measures and pay-for-performance models. Guidelines are easily accessible. If you're interested in guidelines, the National Guidelines Clearinghouse at www.guideline.gov has over a thousand in its database, most of which can be downloaded. Now let's look at decision analysis. Decision analysis applies a formal structure that allows the integration of evidence about both beneficial and harmful effects of treatment options with associated data use and preferences. Decision analysis enables us to explicitly lay out the factors that go into decision making and assign numerical values and calculate a value and quantitative measure to guide decision making. Decision analysis can be applied to the care of a single patient, but more commonly in recent years, decision analysis has been used to inform decisions about policy. Here is an example of a simple decision analysis that revolves around the decision to use anticoagulation in a patient with atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is where the upper chamber of the heart fibrillates and blood can accumulate because it's not properly pumped out of the atrium. This can form clots, and if the individual then goes back into a normal rhythm, the clot can be pushed forward out of the heart and pieces of it can potentially go up into the cerebral circulation and cause a stroke. There are basically three options for a patient with atrial fibrillation in whom we want to prevent a stroke. We can do nothing, give no prophylaxis. We can use aspirin, which is a mild blood thinner, or we can administer warfarin, also known as Coumadin, which is a much more potent blood thinner. For each of these options, we have two possibilities. The patient can either have a stroke or not have a stroke, and any one of these options will potentially lead to adverse bleeding. Because we have two possible options, we have four permutations. No stroke with no bleed, a stroke with no bleed, no stroke with bleeding, and a stroke with bleeding. Obviously, the best thing for the patient would be to have neither a stroke nor bleeding. We know from the medical literature that warfarin is more effective at preventing stroke, but it also has a higher rate of bleeding. We'd actually apply numbers into these different pathways through the decision analysis to make our decision. The circles are the chance nodes because with each of these treatments, there's a chance of any of those four outcomes. The diamond is the decision node for the decision that we're trying to make. How do we actually use a decision analysis? Essentially, we have to put numerical values on the pathways through the decision tree. Some of those pathways involve incorporating utility values that the patient has. Patients may express preferences for adverse outcomes. They may be more tolerable of stroke or of bleeding. Sometimes, in the cases of surgery patients, they may be more willing to tolerate the upfront risks of surgery than to risk the consequence of not having surgery and possibly having a longer-term, worse outcome. So we plug evidence values and utility values into the tree. Then we do a process called folding the tree back, where we basically determine the optimal pathway through the tree. What are the limitations of decision analysis? Decision analysis may present an idealized situation that may not completely apply to a patient, although it does give a framework for making a decision or deviating from a standardized approach. The real challenge with decision analysis, particularly when we apply it to individual patients, is that it's time-consuming and very dependent on trying to quantify things that may not be quantifiable, such as how much risk to assign to one outcome versus another. Decision analysis has not had a major impact when used on the individual level, though for policy decisions, it's actually been quite valuable. This concludes Lecture G of Evidence-Based Practice. In summary, there are two main approaches for making recommendations based on evidence clinical practice guidelines, and decision analyses. Clinical practice guidelines provide steps and decision points for providing clinical care. Decision analysis allows elucidation of a framework for making optimal decisions. This also concludes evidence-based practice.
In summary, evidence-based medicine provides a set of tools and a disciplined approach to informing clinical decision-making. It helps us to find the best evidence to answer the four basic types of clinical questions, interventions, diagnosis, harm, and prognosis. It also provides two approaches to making recommendations, clinical practice guidelines and decision analyses.